Hello and welcome to this short video introducing some of the ideas in the work of Andrew Shanks concerned with the person of Jesus and some of my own ideas which were inspired by Shanks and published in Christ and the Other. I will give some outline of the ideas in relation to Jesus' life and ministry before turning to some of the underlying theological questions in relation to incarnation, cross and resurrection in the light of Shanks' insights. And then I will outline, outline my own argument, which proposes that Jesus may be understood as the shaken one. What then can we see in Jesus' life in terms of what can be called the gospel as the gospel of shakenness? After all, the concept of shakenness is crucial to Shanks. It is about being shaken out of lies, cliches, prejudices, the limitations of any single culture and opened up to the demands of transcendence, the fullness of reality in the light of God. God being the one ultimately who shakes, whose revelation shakes us open. In other words, if God is to be understood as perfect truth as openness, the highest kind of truth for Shanks, being this propensity or disposition or art of being hospitably, empathetically, generously, graciously open to reality in all its awkwardness and pain of being lovingly in relationship even with us in all the ways that we are not like God, then how do we see this demonstrated in the person and purpose of Jesus? Shanks identifies three kinds of dishonesty, three ways in which such truth as openness is worked against, and I think it is quite clear how these are exposed and confronted in the ministry of Jesus. The first, dishonesty is manipulation, whereby a gang or elite or clique manipulate the public to toe the line at the expense of those who are expendable, the scapegoats, those sacrificed by the system. This is confronted by Jesus in his challenge to the norms and systems of his day, religious, cultural and political oppressions, as he took sides with the poor, with lepers, with children and women, all on the margins. Secondly, in response to dishonesty as banality, which makes us closed to those outside our herd, indifferent to what they may have to say to us, Jesus transgressed borders, engaged with outsiders, opened up the possibility, possibility of new community. And thirdly, where a community disowns its own shadow side to present a pure and clean version of itself, it disowns people and stories too. And Jesus exposed this, re-engaging with those who had been disowned. We can see this too, as Shanks points out, in the Beatitudes, a sermon which expresses God's blessing for those who are shaken, those who are poor, who are shaken out of the lies of the system and yearn for an alternative, those who mourn, shaken out of the lies in which we live, about life carrying on, about things being under control. No, we are stopped in our tracks by the reality of loss. Those who prioritise mercy, shaken out of the lie that retribution is the only way to achieve justice. Those who yearn for justice, shaken out of the lie that injustice is simply inevitable. And so on. The spirit of shakenness runs through the whole enterprise of Jesus' ministry and his declaration of the kingdom of God. The solidarity of the shaken on earth as in heaven, a solidarity of all sorts gathered together in this shared encounter with an awakening to reality as it is and the demands this places on us to be more neighbourly. So Shanks speaks of Jesus as free-spirited, daring to go against the norms and expectations of religio-political systems and of his pathos of shakenness, a whole series of commitments expressed in terms of radical unease with any sort of establishment mindedness, that is confronting the elites which manipulate, but yearning for an appropriate solidarity, no matter how frustrating, that is reckoning with the temptation to disown, to tidy up the boundaries of fellowship by holding the tensions together, and not creating a counter establishment, a herd closed in on itself, but something genuinely different, reaching for fresh air. But before we turn to the theological ideas of incarnation, cross and resurrection, a reminder of what Shanks sees as the big issue to be addressed. Unatonement, the universal condition or original sin, which is defined in terms of our not being at one with reality or cut off from it in various ways, unempathetically. 
This is fed by the civil war within us between different ways of engaging with reality. What is changeable within us is always receptive to fresh experience. But other parts of ourselves are attached to un unchangeability, closing us down, ensuring that we only engage by way of what we already know or think or love. And this internal insecurity or vulnerability within us is exploited by external systems and forces and gangs, which also opt for closing things down, serving the interests of those already with power and cutting us off from alternative possibilities. We see this in Jesus' engagement with the powers. He's trying to open things up to create alternatives, but they want him closed down and ultimately they crucify him. So he dies in solidarity with all who suffer at the hands of such systems, those who are scapegoats, outsiders, the silenced. But God raises him to new life, vindicating him and God's solidarity with all such victims. The power of crucifixion is turned against the system, undoing its hold over us. Its moral bankruptcy is exposed. This is resurrection. But we should watch out. It can be tempting to make him about our own truth as correctness, reducing our understanding of Jesus to what an institution requires us to say and believe. In this way, Christ becomes the epitome of what can go wrong in theology, where people project the false Lord God, creating the ultimate external manipulator out of our own desire for control and boundaries. Jesus the liberator instead becomes the Jesus of crowd control, correct belief, keeping other voices silenced, closing down conversation. It's as though by making it all about correct articulation of doctrine, like the incarnation and the atonement, we detract people's attention from what it's really meant to be about, the scandalous hospitality of truth as openness. That is what the doctrines are supposed to point to. But if we focus on the doctrines without recognising the challenge that they represent of God's shaking us open, we reduce and domesticate Jesus and risk closing things down. But the power of Christ remains as a counterblast counter to any such unatonement, even within theology, because he dies in solidarity, in solidarity with slaves and the silenced and all who are pushed out, opening up the possibility of new space, new conversation, ongoing pursuit of a new world. As Shank suggests, Christ can be reduced to nothing more than just another face, another mask for the self-projection of the unchangeable, whereas he is meant to be the very spirit of shakenness. So we should keep asking ourselves, is our Christology, our understanding of Christ, more about blessing the crucifiers, those who would justify such systems, even if it means sacrificing or silencing certain people? Or are we on the side of the crucified, those who suffer at the hands of any such system, religious or political? Now let's turn to my own work, which you will find in Christ and the Other, based on my doctoral research. It was concerned with the question, how should we do Christology? I.e., how do we go about understanding who Jesus is? And the theologian Peter Hodgson suggests we need to be alert to the breadth of the Christian tradition. We need to engage with religious diversity and with the practical pursuit of liberation and justice. All of these factors feed into the process. Shanks, meanwhile, speaks of three virtues of the church, having sanctity to who we are, transgressing boundaries and being in solidarity with others. And these two different sets of three ideas share a similar pattern, which is no surprise because both Hodgson and Shanks are both indebted to the philosopher Hegel. For Hegel, there were three key ideas, identity, difference and solidarity. And both Hodgson and Shanks are working with these ideas. That is, we need to keep asking ourselves, what is our identity? Who are we? And so for Shanks, when we ask that question, do we tend to disown certain versions of ourselves, others within, as I call them? And these questions are relevant to Jesus. When we look to his identity, who do we include 
and who do we disown? Secondly, what of difference? Those outside our own identity. Who are they and how should we relate to them? Or for Shanks, are we stuck in our unthinking banality, our herd mentality, being closed to the others beyond, as I call them? So in understanding Jesus, do we look for his relationships with those outside his own tradition? And thirdly, what are the greater solidarity being pursued? Whose tomorrow should it be? Addressing the danger of manipulation, which cuts us off from each other, especially those who are rendered invisible by systems and structures of domination. So with Jesus, how do we see him pursuing liberation and justice for all? But a crucial thing for me is that Jesus doesn't just initiate in each of these regards, even though we tend to think of him as the man of action. He is also responsive to others. People who interrupt his journeys, his teaching, his quiet times, people who effectively shake him open to other aspects of reality and therefore show us more about him. This is to say Jesus should be understood relationally. His identity does not exist in a vacuum. We do social Christology, understanding his identity in terms of his relationship with different kinds of others. Those within his tradition, those outside it, and those underneath the radar, but invisible to polite society. To understand him then is to understand those around him and vice versa, as Elizabeth Schussler Firenze argues. So we see him being receptive to others' experiences, stories, truths. He is shaken open, bearing witness, therefore, to God's truth as openness, God's loving openness to reality in all its awkwardness, diversity, pain and potential. What this means is that Christ's identity is not just given, it is more like a becoming. It grows through relationship with others. I speak of mutual humanization, a process of becoming more fully human through relationship with different kinds of others, others within, others beyond and invisible others. Relationships which are loving, hospitable, empathetic, receptive, shaken. This reflects something of what Walter Wink calls the myth of the human being, that is the big story of Jesus as the truly human one, trailblazing what it means to become human. It involves an integration of light and shadow sides in ourselves, and that is not only in others, but in Jesus too. And this process continues, even in Jesus. He continues to be shaken open from, by fresh experience, because resurrection means that he was not confined to then and there, but even now is shaken open by fresh encounters with different others. In this way, we participate in cross in Christology as the body of Christ today, sharing in this process of becoming more fully human through relationship with others. And therefore witnessing to the solidarity of the shaken, a work in progress, in process, in community with each other. I appreciate that's a lot of ideas to explore, but I hope at least it stimulates your own thinking and wondering and questioning.